Hi, it's Chris with Implied Music. Yesterday, my review of Spitfire Audio's Chamber Strings Essentials went up, and it's kind of a technical review, but to get to know the library, I recorded, a, composed and recorded a short piece of music that used all of the instruments, two violins, viola, celli, basses, um, and a lot of the articulations. It's kind of like a John Adams piece. I'll freely admit to having allowed myself to be influenced by him. Today, I'd like to do a video just talking about the musical side of that process. It's not so much about the sample library as it is about the actual music. We'll talk about choice of instruments, voicings, structural concerns, tempi, things like that. Well, let's take a look at it. <laughs> First, a little housekeeping. If this is the second or third video of mine that you've seen and you're finding this content useful, subscribe to the channel. It, it helps us out here a lot. We're, we're building a community of producers, of composers, of musicians who are interested in really building their musical foundation in a way that helps their own music making. I hope this is music theory for everyone. Well, to that end, I usually just show everything on the piano roll, and that's what I'll do today, despite the fact that we're really talking about composition. And I'll cop to this. I didn't write this out in notation at all. So what we're going to be looking at today is kind of like my version of notation. When I'm composing a piece of music like this and I want to get it done really quickly, I'm basically working like an improvisational keyboard player and... Uh, an expressionist painter, layering tracks on, pulling things out in the same way that any progressive, I think, EDM composer and loop based composer works. But there's a lot going on here that has musical foundations. Like I said, it's influenced by John Adams' work. And if you're interested in more of this kind of thing, listen to his early composing and um, pieces like Shaker Loops, it, great to listen to. Um, it, perhaps later, and I think what this is most directly influenced by, um, Nixon in China is a big full opera, but there's a, a shorter piece. It's I, I'm not even sure it's actually in the opera, but it's sort of condensed from the, the material called The Chairman Dances. And like, if you just turned this video off and go listen to that right now, it would be, <laughs> I wouldn't have any trouble with that at all. The Chairman Dances is an amazing piece of music, and there's a lot to learn. Okay, assuming you're still here, let's listen to this little piece of music, two minutes long. We'll come back and we'll pick it to shreds. <laughs>
Well, if you've been here before, you know that uh, for many years I was a dance accompanist and I'm still very involved in the sort of dance world. And so I just love propulsion. And this piece begins with some serious propulsion. And uh, the way it's achieved is uh, exactly the way uh, Adams uh, does it in Chairman Dances, which is to use a uh, figure in the violins, first and second violins, that I think of it, I, ca I call it in my brain oscillation, but uh, John has said chugga chugga before I've heard him say that. Um, listen to the, the violins, they're going da 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 da. Now, what's happening there is actually very simple because I've got this simple D minor triad and each um, part has a little bit of it is one of them it's in thirds and I'm in a simple D minor sort of space it's a D minor D Dorian scale and then the second violin or the, actually the first violins I think are down below here they're going flat seven all together you get this It's, you know, just a D minor chord and a C chord going back and forth really, really fast, except I only let it happen for a measure before it modulates to a interesting sort of, I guess I think of it as a semi-parallel key. D minor becomes D flat major. This note in common acts as a pivot point for it, and you can see it happening in the score right here. There's my D flat in the bass, a Pitts bass and things modulate, the A goes down to A flat, et cetera. And up here, these long held tones are harmonics on the viola and the cello. Thicker, lower instruments, but playing harmonics for a kind of an interesting color. That's what happens for the first, you know, eight bars. The Pitts bass is throwing in offbeats and it kind of makes it much more exciting and interesting. Now, um, you can see I add a second lower version down here. This is a cello doing exactly the same thing. And as it comes in, it gives us a little more thickness in the sound, although really the sound doesn't change. By the way, I'm sure you've noticed this, but I've written out what's happening over here. D Dorian alternating with what I think of as D flat mixolydian sometimes with a um, Lydian sound based in it. Here comes the cello. The cello. Thickens it up, doesn't it? It's a nice effect. Now, in this one moment before I'm going to a whole new section, I've given something to the cellos here, which is sort of momentarily kind of dissonant. That's a chromatic line, and you, you don't register it consciously the first time you hear it, except as kind of a weird tension. See if you can pick it out. Do you hear how it's like, Wah! that's kind of functioning like a dominant, a moment of real serious tension. It's like a riser, but a harmonic riser just to create some strange tension. Okay, now it's time for section two, which you can see I've called legato, and I'm using the same harmonic concept, the D minor sound, D flat major sounds. Bright, there's the F in common. But I'm thinking about the whole collection of notes here. And because I'm creating, an, you can see it on the screen, an ascending legato line, all the voices ascending against this sort of bass that's just kind of outlining very, very simply the roots of the changes. I need to think about the scale every time. Let's listen to how this works. Here, come the, here comes the legato line. Look at what happens. A is followed by B. There's the, the Dorian vibe within that. And as I continue on, when I get to bar 20, it's time for a D flat sound. The next note above that is the D flat. Every time I change chords, I ask myself in each voice, What's the next scale tone? Those are the kinds of things that happen as you push the melodic ascent through the chord progression. You can hear it happening. D. 
new key for a second, right? New scale, really. And up to D, continues on up, although it's D flat. Here comes the dominant chord. I slowed down a bit for the legato, and now it's time for the second propulsion section. And this propulsion section has a two against three rhythm. Listen to the rhythm once we get there. Whole new chord scheme. Now, I love this rhythmic scheme. So I've got a pulse that's like this. And if I go one, two, three, one, two, three, you can really hear the triplet, right? But if I just use two notes, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, I get a kind of an alternation. And that's what I'm doing here. That alternation between the accents on the higher note and then the accent on the lower note creates a nice effect. And Glass uses it in, in their music a lot. And we hear it all the time. Against that, a simple eighth note gives a kind of a dancey two out of three propulsion. Now, the bass down here, just kind of first just pulsing. You can really hear the two against three, I hope. This is a two measure chord cycle, and then it goes to a one measure chord cycle. In other words, it's the same chord cycle, it's just been compacted. Here's the chord progression over here. F major to D flat major. Did you see the F in common? D flat major to E major. Did you see this tone in common? I'll look at it again. D flat major. Watch this note. It's E major. The fifth of the D flat chord became the third of the E major chord. Now watch this note again. It's time for A flat major. As the chord progression condenses, I took the bass and I put it on two and four instead of on one and three. And it goes like this. Right? Propels things more. Well, here we go. We're getting into a big transition moment that uh, A flat major becomes kind of like a C augmented again, right? And you can see these descending lines in each of the parts. Everybody gets a crack at it. I've also slammed in a big pits moment to kind of emphasize it. You're just kind of things that you might do with drums, but you've only got strings. <laughs> All right, all right, now we're going to go back to the last propulsion section, and we're back to something quite simple and really kind of tight. At some level, just a C major chord, right? We'll hear that same propulsion start to happen, though. It kind of goes from C major to D flat Lydian over C. Well, just listen. Your ear will tell you what you think. Very C major. And then the little pulse, the alternation. And then here's the change. Kind of a D Lydian sound. It's very tense because of the Phrygian quality of the D flat major over the C. Really just heading for the ending here. I flip the rolls of the bass and the top, G in the bass now. And now just going to a sort of a pullback. I'm like pulling out rhythms. Now every three beats. Now every four. I'm really happy that you can look at it here on the screen in the edit mode. If you work a little bit on learning reading orchestral notation, there are many examples of the greatest classical composers' work available as orchestra scores. And one of the major components of any serious sort of composer and arranger's learning process is to listen to a great piece of work while score reading. I will also say this, standard MIDI files for, for most major orchestral and, you know, say, chamber works of the great composers 
are available just by searching for them. You can just drag a standard MIDI file into Logic and I think GarageBand as well, and it will just populate the correct instruments. Well, I've talked enough. I hope this has been useful. Like and subscribe, ding the bell. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.